Well, now you know about triglycerides, the most abundant of the lipids or the fats in the human body. Uh, what's next? Ah, now we're going to talk about my favorite lipid because, of course, I have a favorite lipid. Why, why would I not? And that is the phospholipids. Now, what is different about phospholipids? Phospholipids, instead of having three, one, two, three fatty acids attached to a glycerol, they've got two fatty acids. And where the third fatty acid would be, they have got a phosphate group, which becomes something called a hydrophilic head. Okay. So hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Remember those? Hydrophilic loves water, hydrophobic hates water, right? So phospholipids, they're like triglycerides, except attached to the glycerol, there are two fatty acids, and when the third one would be, there's a phosphate group. Now, those fatty acid, that the fatty acid port, oh, let me show you a picture. The fatty acid portion of a phospholipid is made, is nonpolar, and is hydrophobic. So it hates water. And this area, the new part with the glycerol and the phosphate, that is polar and hydrophilic, and it loves water. Now, uh, they usually refer to these fatty acids as hydrophobic tails, and I don't know why they do that. Because first of all, there are two of them, what has two tails? And secondly, they clearly look like legs. But I usually think of them as legs, but these are um, the lipid part of this lipid molecule, the hydrophobic part of this lipid molecule. Now, the fact that these molecules have got one end that loves water and one end that hates water makes these molecules amphipathic. And because they are amphipathic, they are remarkable, which is why I like them so much. Now, it's not that phospholipids are smart. They're not smart, okay? Um, do they do anything? No, they don't exactly do anything. But just by being amphipathic, if I take a bunch of these guys, put them into some salt water, blend them up, then if I go back a while later and look at them through the microscope, I will find little bubbles like this that are entirely stable. And why do they happen? Well, first of all, I want you to notice that there are two layers of phospholipid. There's one layer that's here on the outside of the bubble. See, this is kind of the outside of the bubble. See the heads, the hydrophilic heads are on the outside and the hydrophobic tails or legs are there on the inside, right? There's one layer there and then on the inside, there's hydrophilic heads that are orienting themselves towards the water that's inside the bubble and hydrophobic tails, again, pointing towards the middle of this layer, right? Now, this is called the phospholipid bilayer. And if you had a nickel for every time I say phospholipid bilayer in this class, well, you'd, I, you'd have probably 20 bucks or something. I'm gonna say it a lot. So make sure you've got it in your head. Is it complicated? Well, frankly, it's not. You know that fat wants to separate from water, right? Does it know where it's going? No, it has something to do with kinetics and chemistry and physics and stuff like that, but it does, right? Now, the phospholipid is just a little tweak of that concept. The fat part here in green wants to get away from the water, the, the blue part, the hydrophilic head, wants to be near water. How can this molecule make it so that both sides of its molecular self are happy is in this arrangement. And what's remarkable is that this phospholipid bilayer is one of the things that made life on planet Earth possible. Because you cannot... As a living creature, you cannot control the entire world at the same time, right? And in order to be alive, you need to control the biochemistry of what's going on. So life was able to develop because there were these little tiny bubbles of phospholipid, and now life 
only has to control the biochemical reactions that are happening in that teeny tiny, less than a droplet of water. Doesn't have to control the whole pond or the whole ocean, just needs to control that. The cell membrane is primarily phospholipid bilayer, okay? Even more remarkable, do I have more pictures? I'll be, get right there. Even more remarkable, if I had a little teeny tiny needle and I was looking through a microscope, I could puncture through this little bubble, I could inject a little bit of red dye, I could pull my needle on out and this thing would not pop. And the reason is that these phospholipids, they're not attached to each other like parts of a piece of rubber are. They are entirely liquid. As a matter of fact, if I labeled that little blue head right there, I'm gonna label it purple. And this little blue head right next to it, I'm gonna label it orange, right? And I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna come back 20 minutes later. This little purple one might be over here. This little orange one might be way down here. They moved. Yes, they are allowed to move. The phospholipid bilayer is entirely fluid and yet entirely stable. So in a lot of ways, it's like a really, really, really crowded water park. If you went to Raging Waters back in the day when we still could do that kind of stuff, and it was a completely packed day and you looked at the lazy river, the lazy river is gonna be covered with kids in inner tubes, right? Now, if you looked out over that completely packed water park, if you looked out over here and you saw a pair of legs up there, you'd be like, okay, wait a minute, what's wrong with that, right? Why? Because we as humans are kind of the opposite of phospholipids. Instead of liking our heads to be wet and our legs to be dry, we like it the opposite way. But you would know that if you flipped any one of these people upside down, they'd flip themselves right back up. Phospholipids do that too, right? Also, if my kid Johnny was out there and refusing to come in, Johnny, sign believe, I could go right through all of these inner tubes and grab little Johnny and people would part as I go in and close up behind me as I left, right? And then I could drag him back out, Johnny, we're leaving. And again, they would leave and come back. That's the way the phospholipid bilayer is. Now, the cell membrane is more than phospholipid bilayer, but the magic of the cell membrane is largely due to phospholipid and why. The phospholipid separates the living cell, which is gonna be all this stuff on the inside. The living cell, those are all the biochemical reactions that a cell can control. You know, what's, what's going on out here? You know, what's going on in my, my neighbor's house? I can't control that. I can only control this house. So the plasma membrane, this phospholipid bilayer, separates the living cell from its non-living surroundings and from its neighbors. And that all starts with the phospholipid. What else is important? Oh, one more thing. Make sure you know that a phospholipid bilayer is arranged so that the hydrophilic heads are on the outside and on the inside, but the hydrophobic tails or legs are pointed towards each other in the middle of the bilayer, okay? What else should we know? We should know a little bit about steroids. Whenever someone says the word steroids or steroid hormones, everyone thinks about the drugs that baseball players are not supposed to inject themselves with, but that is not what a steroid is. Steroid is the name of a chemical structure. This general structure with this hexagon, 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 pentagon, that is a steroid molecule. It's a chemical structure. Now, testosterone and the stuff that baseball players are not supposed to inject, are those steroids? Well, yes, they are. But so is estrogen. And no one's worried about Bob Batter injecting himself with estrogen. But technically, if he was injecting himself with estrogen, he would be injecting himself with steroids. So one of the things that you need to know is that when we say steroids or steroid hormones, we are not just talking about testosterone and their relatives. A very important steroid is cholesterol. This is cholesterol. All of the steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen and the others that we will learn about when we get to the endocrine system, they are all made 
from molecules of cholesterol. You may know someone who's got high levels of cholesterol, and so you may know that the cholesterol that's in our bloodstream is not from what we eat, it's actually being made by our body. And you may have wondered, why would our body do that? And the reason our body makes cholesterol is because it needs to. Cholesterol, this molecule is used to stabilize your cell membranes, and it's also used as the starting molecule for building all of these hormones. We'll come back to that later. So, so far we've talked about carbohydrates and lipids. Oh, prostaglandins. We won't talk much about prostaglandins, but prostaglandins are small molecules that are important to the uh, process of inflammation in the human body. And they're also a very tiny uh, lipid. Let's answer some of these questions. An atom with a negative charge, what is true about that? Give yourself some time. Well, electrons are positively charged, pro I'm sorry, electrons are negatively charged, protons are positively charged, neutrons are neutral. So if I had more negatively charged things than positively charged things, overall I'd have a negative charge. So B, yep, okay. Which of these is an example of a polysaccharide? Glucose, monosaccharide. Maltose, monosaccharide. Fructose, monosaccharide. Now, maltose is a disaccharide. Fructose, monosaccharide. Protein, well, that's a protein. Glycogen, glycogen is a starch. Starches, and some people consider glycogen an animal starch, and fiber, those are things that are, um, like cellulose, those are things that are polysaccharides, right? What are saturated fats saturated with? Go ahead and pause the video because we're moving right along to the saturated with hydrogen. Unsaturated fats have got double covalent bonds between adjacent carbons. What are the major lipids of plasma membranes? We just talked about it. Those are the phospholipids, yep. Isotopes of atoms differ in their number of what? Okay, well, they, they don't differ in their numbers of protons because if it had different number of protons, they'd be different elements. So that's not it, okay? So then all the above are true, no, right? So A, B, D, right? Do they have a different number of electrons? Let me remember. No, different number of electrons would be the difference between ions and how much charge they have, right? Different number of neutrons, yes. I remember Tydell saying that isotopes have got different numbers of neutrons. I'm going to answer A, not so fast. Look what she did. Only A and D are true? I better read that one. Mass number, wait, what's mass number? Mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Ah, if I've got two atoms of the same element, they have the same number of protons. If they have a different number of neutrons, they would have different mass numbers. So the answer is A and D are true. All right, that's it. We will pick up talking about proteins and then nucleic acids at the next video.